Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're talking to a man who's known as the professor and whose classes have been dubbed the best barbecue experience in the US by the Food Network. Hey family, I hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. This is super exciting today. We have the one and only Stephen Reichlin on the line with us. He's in the green room right now. We're going to be bringing him in just shortly. For the last 25 years, he's published 31 books. He has several of his own TV shows and he founded the original Barbecue University, which is super awesome. So we're going to be talking to him very shortly, but I've got a couple of announcements I need to run by you first. First up, I'd like to thank Jagged Woodfire for coming on board as our podcast partner for this episode. If you're out there and you're looking for a new smoker, a new cabinet smoker, a smoker oven, asado grill, if you've got a custom kitchen fit out that you need to start your own barbecue joint, check them out, hit them up. They do incredible stuff. Glenn loves a challenge and together with his wife Jules, all their designs are competition proven and tested. They are the current international team of the year for brisket in the KCBS. So you know that their designs of their smokers are top notch and everything works beautifully. Now, if you are just at the beginning of your barbecue journey, head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com. We have our free ebook available for you. It's the Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. And in that, you're going to find everything you need to know to go from zero to hero in the world of low and slow barbecue and be king of the barbecue in your neighborhood. And a big greeting this morning to everybody in the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community. It's our Facebook group and it's where we do these live podcast recordings. So if you're not there yet, make sure you come and join the group. We'd love to have you. It's a family friendly group. We just hang out and talk about barbecue. All the other guff is left at the door and you get the opportunity to ask questions and things of our guests. So make sure you come along and join us over there if you're not there already. Now, if you're watching this later on on the catch ups, If you're on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, a subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Over on Facebook, it's all about the likes, the comments, and the shares, particularly the shares. On Instagram, we love those cute little love hearts and the comments and the follows. And if you are listening in on a podcasting app, please take a couple of minutes, give us a five-star rating and review. We're not exactly sure how, but somehow it helps to drive us up the charts. And we have been as high as number three in Australia for food and six in the US for food, which is a huge achievement. And it all comes down to those five-star ratings and reviews. So thank you very much for everything you've done to support us as well. Now, I think that's about all the blah, blah, blah you need out of me. Let's get Stephen in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? The one and only Stephen Reichlin. Welcome to the confessional, my friend. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, uh, it's a great honor to be here. Mate, it's our honor to have you. To have someone who is uh, at, as richly steeped in the barbecue history as yourself is a huge privilege here for us. Now, I always kick things off with the same question, uh, and it feels a little bit funny asking this of you because you're always cooking a recipe for your website or doing a TV show or doing something, but I'm going to change it just a little bit. What was the last thing that you barbecued for yourself purely because you wanted to eat it? Uh, Actually, it was a leg of lamb that we did last night. Uh, I know you guys love lamb down there. We do. Uh, We flavored it with a spice paste made of uh, pureed shallots, lemon zest, black olives, uh, hot peppers, that salt slathered all over the lamb. And then uh, we spit roasted it with uh, just a touch of oak wood on the coals. And let me tell you, it was fabulous. Oh, delicious. And so was that done in a, like in a particular grill or was it over a fire pit? Uh, it was uh, done in a Weber kettle grill. Oh, right. Very cool. And is that your, your favorite barbecue to grill on or are you contractually obliged to not have favorites? Oh, no, no, no. I, uh, I own many grills. I love many grills. You know, I love all my grills. Uh, that just happened to be the one I used. Uh, I, I actually, I like the kettle for spit roasting because you can cover it. You can add wood chunks to the coals. So you can do what I call smoke tissery grilling or uh, smoke, smoke tissery, smoke roasting uh, on the rotisserie. And it's a ni- nice way to combine two methods uh, in one dish. 
Yeah, sounds very handy indeed. I've always wanted to get one of those rotisseries for my Weber kettle, but I just never seem to be able to track one down. Um, you know, they're widely available. It's really one of the best investments I've ever made. It comes with a collar uh, to, uh, you know, to raise the lid to make room for the rotisserie. And one nice thing about that collar is if you're indirect grilling or smoking a turkey, you know, you need a little bit more uh, upward clearance. So even if you're not spit roasting, uh, the collar can come in very handy. Indeed, yeah. I remember my uh, my mother-in-law's from the US, and when she came out to visit, one of the things she taught me to do was to smoke a whole turkey in the Weber. And I remember putting that turkey on there, and we didn't have a collar. I remember putting the turkey on there, looking at it, going, I don't think this lid's going to go on, but somehow right, it exactly. did. Yeah, Must have been yeah. a small turkey. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Now, I've been reading your bio to prepare for this, and what I usually like to do is kind of go through people's history and but we only have an hour, so I, I, I can't sort of go through everything. So I've sort of picked a couple of things. And one of the things that really stood out as sounding like an incredible experience was I understand you actually went to Europe at one stage and traveled through Europe studying medieval cooking. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, this is a kind of a funny little detour, but uh, indirectly it got me into barbecue. So uh, oh. I attended Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Uh, where I majored in French literature. Talk about a nice practical uh, introduction to barbecue. And when I, I wrote my thesis on a medieval poet who turned out to be the first uh, feminist in Europe, uh, a message that mostly eluded the 21-year-old uh, idiot male that I was at the time. But while I was doing my research, I came across a medieval cookbook called The Form of Curry. And it blew my mind. I thought, you know, here 800 years ago, people are writing cookbooks and writing is the operative word because back then it was handwritten. So I proposed uh, to study medieval cooking in Europe to a foundation called the Watson Foundation. And much to my great astonishment, uh, they gave me a grant to study medieval cooking in Europe. This is back in 1975. Uh, I've since become friends with the foundation uh, uh, directors, and, you know, they pulled their hair out. I can't believe we I gave this guy a, a, a grant to eat and drink his way through <laughs> Europe. But that's indeed what I did. And I really, at that point, became fascinated by the intersection of food and history and culture. And I've been doing that ever since. Yeah, that's a... Sounds like an absolute, uh, just amazing opportunity there. So can you tell us a bit about the, the cooking styles that you experienced? Was it all just like open fire? Because in my, in, my, in my mind, I'm picturing things like, you know, movies like Robin Hood, where they just sort of make a ring of stones and then light a fire in the middle and then stick a, stick a pheasant on a stick and just sort of hold it out over the fire. Well, actually, it was, I mean, certainly the sole fuel for cooking in the Middle Ages was uh, a wood fire or a charcoal fire. Uh, so all cooking was done, that was done was done live, by live fire. Uh, the similarities and differences. So similarities, first of all, an extravagant use of spices. Spices were status symbols in the Middle Ages. You know, people often say they were used to uh, cover up the taste of rancid meat. I don't believe that. I mean, I believe that people... <laughs> figured out how to cure and preserve meat very effectively in the Middle Ages. But, so, but spicing was extravagant. And in fact, uh, you know, it, it's been argued the, the Crusades opened up the spice route, uh, at very least. And, you know, in that, if you think about modern barbecue and the um, affection we have for barbecue rubs for intensely flavored marinades, you know, you would find a real uh, kindred spirit. Now, in the Middle Ages, people also uh, used live fire. They loved spit roasting. Uh, there was a real sense of pageantry and play in medieval cooking. And uh, this will be a little circuitous. But anyhow, uh, the most famous medieval chef was a French chef named Taillevon. And he wrote a cookbook in roughly 1375 that by gum is still in print today. May Barbecue Bible and my other books only enjoy the same success 500, 600 years from now. And in that book, I found a recipe for grilled eggs. And the recipe uh, called on poking a hole in the egg, blowing out the egg, uh, beating it, putting it back in the shell somehow, putting it on a skewer, and putting it over fire. And I thought, yeah, sure, like this is really going to work, right? Anyhow, a few years ago, I was in Cambodia researching my book, uh, Planet Barbecue. 
And what did I see at a street barbecue stall but grilled eggs? Three shells lined up on a bamboo skewer, the shells blackened with fire. And I uh, finally learned how that, uh, that tour de force was done. And the secret is, yes, you poke a little hole in one side of the egg, big hole in the other. You blow the egg out. You scramble it. In the case of Cambodians, they're mixing it with fish sauce and sugar and black pepper, putting it back in the eggshell with a funnel. And then they steam the egg to set that liquid mixture and then skewer it and then finish cooking it on a, uh, on a bamboo skewer. Now, I just came out with a book called How to Grill Vegetables, and I have a chapter on eggs in that book, and uh, I replicated uh, that recipe, and then I reprised the medieval recipe and readapted it for modern age. So I guess the um, bottom line is sometimes, you know, the more things seem like they've changed, the more they remain the same. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I've never heard of uh, of, of grilled eggs done that way. I, I remember uh, when I was in primary school, I had a, a Ukrainian school teacher who used to make us sort of poke holes in the eggs and and uh, he he would blow the inside of the egg out, and then we'd sit there with candles and wax, and we'd and food yeah. dye, and we'd make Ukrainian Easter eggs. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That that's as close as I've as I've ever got to what you were just describing. Well, now you, you know I, I I love grilled and smoked eggs, and you were holding up my book Project Smoke uh, a few minutes ago, and uh, thank you for that. Nice to know it's available so far away from home. Anyhow, uh, one of my favorite recipes in that book it's. Uh, you smoke hard-boiled eggs, and then you use the smoked eggs either to make deviled eggs or egg salad. And it's absolutely, it's a revelation. Absolute revelation. And do you have to poke the hole in that as well, or are you going to, no. uh, like, does the smoke no, those, sort of permeate the eggshell? No, what you do is you hard-boil the eggs, leave them a little soft, maybe instead of 11 minutes, you go 8 or 9 minutes, and then peel the eggs, and then you smoke them in your smoker. If it's a low, slow smoke. Uh, cut the egg in half. If you're going to do deviled egg, smoke it, then scoop uh, scoop out the yolk and mix it with uh, mustard mayonnaise. Oh, right. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> right. Sorry, I apologize. Um, no, so no, no, you, because you, the method you described is also legit, and I've done that. Uh, but when I do that method, then I would be more likely to scramble the eggs and, you know, make smoke scrambled eggs. I mean, smoke is amazing. Smoke is the, I call it the umami of barbecue, and it just sort of, makes everything taste better and more interesting. Yeah, can't, I couldn't agree with that more. Now, you mentioned that, uh, that that trip to study medieval cooking was what got you interested in barbecue. What were some of the similarities between, um, between that and, and barbecue? That's, or, or maybe a better way of putting that is how, how did you make that uh, transition or that, uh, that movement from the medieval into barbecue? Well, the transition was actually a transition that lasted about 15 years. I did not get into barbecue right away. So I came back from Europe, and because French cuisine was what I knew from having spent a year and a half in Paris, uh, I wrote a couple of books on uh, French cuisine, and then I became uh, the restaurant critic for Boston Magazine. So that kind of took me on a detour to restaurant and travel writing. And then during that restaurant reviewing period, I developed a cholesterol problem. So it was before the advent of Lipitor. So I uh, wrote a series of books on low-fat cooking, which helped me control my problem. Uh, fast forward to uh, 19, uh, 1994, and I was actually working on uh, a book on uh, Caribbean and Floridian cuisine. I had just moved down to Miami. I remember where I was sitting, what I was wearing, what the weather was like. It was one of those sort of time slowed down. And it was as though I heard the words, follow the fire. The idea was, uh, in a nutshell, grilling is the world's oldest and most universal cooking method. But everywhere it's done differently. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool to travel around the world and document how people grill in different cultures and countries? And that became a book uh, known as the Barbecue Bible, just the right book at the right time. It became an international bestseller, and that's how I got into barbecue. Right, that's uh, th that's quite the uh, quite the interesting story there. And you sort of jumped straight into uh, into writing a book. And now since then, you've got a total of thirty one different books out. Now, I mean, people, uh, you know, we 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 get excited when when somebody gets one book out. You've had thirty one. How do you? Uh, 
how do you keep coming up with all these different ideas for all these books? Uh, well, actually it's 32. A new one has come out since that last press release, but that's the, uh, how to grow vegetable book. But within barbecue, I mean, I think what's kept me fascinated about barbecue and engaged in barbecue, um, is that it's a subject that is both extremely deep and extremely broad. And what I mean by that is you can drill down on a single subject like smoking, like project smoke, or you can take a very broad approach, like a book like Planet Barbecue or Barbecue Bible, where you look at how people grill for Planet Barbecue. I visited 70 countries, you know, so you can look at how people grill in 70 countries. It's a field where you can write a book about it. You can make a TV show about it. You can start a barbecue university uh, about it. Uh, you can create your own line of spice rubs. You can create your own line of prepared barbecue that you sell by mail order. Uh, these are all activities that I have done over the years with barbecue. And, you know, uh, I, what I love about it, every morning I wake up, you never know what the next opportunity is going to be and what the next project is going to be. Yeah, it's quite, a, quite an amazing lifestyle that you've been able to build for yourself. Of the 70 countries that you were able to visit for Barbecue Bible, what were some of the most exotic things that you found in, in different countries? So, for, for example, in my own research, I found Mongolian barbecue to be really interesting, putting the hot rocks in the pot and then putting a pot inside the pot and then hoping it doesn't explode on you through the day. So what, was the, um, what are some of the more uh, exotic things that you found in your research for that book? Well, for me as an American, when I visited Australia, I mean, eating kangaroo, that was uh, something I had never uh, eaten before. And there were uh, many, uh, many f fish and seafood items that we don't, that you guys have, we don't get. Um, Think about kind of weird foods. Uh, let's see, in Greece, there's a dish called kokoretsi, where they take the brain and liver and testicles and lungs and spleen and other uh, unmentionables of a, of a lamb and skewer them on a big spit, wrap the whole shebang in small intestines and spit roast it over charcoal. That's kind of like haggis, you know, the, uh, the Scottish dish haggis is haggis on a, on a spit is what I call it. And the amazing thing about it is it tasted, I mean, it's actually pretty delicious. In Peru, I ate anticuchos, which are kebabs made with beef hearts. Uh, in Korea, they take uh, nori seaweed, brush it with sesame oil, season it with salt, toast it over a live fire. That has become a favorite snack for me. Uh, you know, one man's weird is another man's delicacy. That was, I guess, maybe the biggest lesson I learned traveling around Planet Barbecue. Yeah, that, uh, that Korean grilled seaweed was a favorite when I was living over there. It goes really well with an icy cold beer. It's, uh, oh. it, it's so good. <laughs> You're making me not only hungry, but thirsty. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's loop back to the new book, How to Grill Vegetables. Give us a bit of an idea of, uh, I mean, like it is all in the title, but give us a bit of an idea of the story with that book. Yeah, well, actually, that's a very personal book uh, because my daughter's a vegetarian. And my wife is like so close to being a vegetarian. I mean, we'll do, you know, this lamb we did the other night, we did it with uh, fire roasted vegetables. I'd say about 98% of, you know, she took one mouthful of lamb and the rest was uh, just vegetables. So there was an element of self-defense. But I also believe that in the States at least, uh, vegetables are sort of shown uh, short shrift sometimes at barbecues. But if you travel the world's barbecue tour, I mean, in Japan, they grill an incredible variety of vegetables. In India, uh, the vegetable is very important. Uh, turkey. So it was a chance for me to sort of celebrate vegetables. And furthermore, you know, I think a lot of us grew up of a certain generation with boiled vegetables. But in fact, there's no better way to cook a vegetable than the high dry heat of a grill, right? That heat caramelizes the natural plant sugars. So uh, the, the book, you know, I'd say about 70 or 80% of it is uh, about grilling vegetables. There's a chapter on grilling breads. There's a chapter on grilling eggs. There's a chapter on grilling cheese. There's a dessert chapter. It's basically sort of my meatless grill book. But there are about a dozen meat recipes with meat in them too, just to, just, just to keep my, uh, my core constituents happy. I was going to say, you've got to protect that reputation. Right, right. <laughs> yeah and so how 
like what's the uh, the public response like been to that? Oh, it's been fantastic. You know, and even among, I mean, I, mean, I knew it would be very positive on the East Coast and the West Coast of the U.S. But even in the meat eating, uh, meat obsessed uh, heartland in the Midwest, people are really uh, appreciating it. Uh, and you know, I'll get guys that come up to me and say, you know, hey, don't let the other guys hear, but I really like grilled vegetables. Uh, so <laughs> you know, it's we're in 2021 now, almost 2022, and and. Our tastes have changed. You know, we, I think we all understand we may love meat, but we understand that there are sort of severe consequences to the planet if, of a solely meat based diet. By incorporating more vegetables into our diets, we can eat more healthily. We can certainly eat more tastily. And we can also help the health of the planet. Well, I certainly know that I could stand to, uh, to eat a few more vegetables. I don't know about yourself, but uh, my doctor would be much happier if I did eat a few more vegetables. <laughs> If you're looking for your next barbecue smoker or grill, Jagged Woodfired has got what you need. Owners Julianne and Glenn are multiple award-winning barbecue competitors who have even travelled to the US to compete at the World Barbecue Championships in Houston, Texas. Based out of Perth and shipping nationwide, Jagged is one of the largest pit builders in the country and has an ever-growing lineup of meat cooking machinery. Not only do they have their now famous smoker ovens, their incredibly efficient gravity-fed cabinets are proving extremely popular in commercial settings. And they also make some of the most stylish asado grills you're ever going to see. Jagged is also well known for amazingly detailed custom work ranging from backyard designs all the way to installations in commercial kitchens. Proudly Australian designed, owned and manufactured, you can find out more at jaggedwoodfired.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D. Once again, head to jaggedwoodfired.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D to learn more. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. Alrighty, now one of the things that I was really excited to to get in and talk about, and it's this is actually on my bucket list, is to get over to the United States and do this, is to attend your barbecue university, which uh, for for the research that I've done, it appears to be basically the original uh, like barbecue school. Give us a bit of a bit of a rundown on on barbecue university uh, is and how it started. Well, uh, the way it started was very simple. You know, I wrote the Barbecue Bible, my first book. It uh, was uh, became an international uh, phenomenon, and uh, I, you know, I found myself in barbecue. So one night, I am an inveterate uh, list maker. I uh, made a list of all the things I wanted to do with barbecue, and there were other books. Uh, there was a TV show. There was a website. Uh, uh, farm program products, but one of them was a barbecue university uh, because I learned to cook at a cooking school in Paris called La Varenne, and I thought if I could kind of teach people how to barbecue and grill, uh, that would be a very cool thing. Now, in order to make it really special and in order for my wife to attend too, my wife loves very luxurious accommodations, so <laughs> I picked a really luxurious resort first in West Virginia, the mountains of West Virginia, then in Colorado, and now we're in the low country of uh, South Carolina at a gorgeous uh, resort called Montage Palmetto Bluff. So you could think of it as sort of a, uh, it's a summer camp for adults who love to grill and barbecue, uh, but with really high thread count linens when you go to bed at night. A very luxurious setting. So that was the principle, really. I guess philosophically, you know, when I started in barbecue, uh, it was really, there was a lot of superstition, you know, we do it this way, we don't know exactly why, because my daddy did it. No, you're doing it the wrong way, you do it that way. Nobody had really kind of tried to understand it as a, a logical system. And that's what I tried to do in books like Barbecue Bible and How to Grill. And at Barbecue University, uh, there's a very specific pedagogy. Uh, I try and cover all five methods of uh, live fire cooking. And we cover all the proteins, you know, from 
uh, beef to lamb to pork to poultry to seafood. We cover the vegetables. We cover all the courses of a meal. So uh, everything from appetizers to desserts. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if a smoked cocktail or a grilled breakfast uh, turned up at Barbecue University, too. Uh, it's set up as what I call a, a participation demonstration. So the first hour, I show the important techniques that I want people to learn. The next hour and a half, I turn them loose. We have uh, about 40 grills and smokers uh, where the students work. They grill and smoke under my supervision. As soon as they finish what they're assigned to do, the class gets really interesting because we're always uh, doing what I call science projects. And we have extra ingredients, and we're always calling on people to kind of unleash their creativity and invent dishes. I think uh, we had one class that once created 28 dishes in one three-hour period. Now, wow. that's the third when everybody's warm. Oh, they were, they were amazing. Uh, you know, there's a there's sort of a, a, a camaraderie and a, also a spirit of competition. You know, each team wants to do better than the next. But it's a great, it's, it's a serious learning uh, experience, and it's also great fun. Yeah, it's, it, it sounds incredible. How long have you been running Barbecue University? Boy, I guess I'm going on 20 years now for Barbecue University. Oh, wow. Okay. And so in that, in that time, how have you seen the, the barbecue trends changing? So have you, seen a, have you seen a shift in demographic? Like is the average barbecuer, is the age going down? Is it going up? Are you seeing much fluctuation in like, is there, are there more women coming to the classes, for example, or different, uh, different protein trends? What sort of things have you seen come and go in that 20 years? Well, the short answer is yes, 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 and yes to all of your questions. But uh, to break it down, I mean, uh, when I started, uh, people were really pretty uh, ignorant about live fire cooking. And even explaining something like the difference between direct grilling and indirect grilling, that was like a real aha moment. That was a, a revelation. Um, today, I mean, people are much more sophisticated, you know, reverse searing. Uh, Ember grilling, uh, layering of flavors. Uh, you know, I've had people who have made porchetta, who have made turducken from scratch. So much more sophisticated. Um, in terms of the demographic, I'd say it's still, you know, it's still pretty varied. We get uh, we getting a lot of millennials now, which I love because they bring a whole new sensibility and set of ideas. Uh, we always have a, a, a big foreign contingent. In fact, we've had uh, many Australians that have come to Barbecue University. Uh, we've had uh, uh, people from, gosh, Hong Kong, Thailand, uh, United Arab Emirates. We had uh, a guy from Mexico. And I'd say more and more of the people coming from abroad are, are professionals. We had a guy who has a very big... Uh, uh, school of barbecue in uh, Mexico, and he actually has branches all over. He runs festivals. And he was fabulous. You know, we get talent like that. I love to harness it. He took it on himself. Uh, one of our students had gone fishing. That new location is right on the May River, so the fishing is fantastic. And they brought some amazing fish back, and uh, this Mexican gentleman took it. He butterflied it in a way I had never seen before. Uh, whipped up a Mexican marinade, a couple of sauces, salsas, homemade uh, tortillas, and we all feasted on these amazing fish tacos, uh, thanks to this gentleman. Yeah, that's incredible. That sounds amazing. Now, you mentioned that, uh, that, that the people get to invent their own dishes there at Barbecue University. Tell us, what are some of the complete disasters that have uh, come through there from that uh, experimentation? Have, like, have people tried to put, you know, uh, anchovy stuffed pork butts or something like that. When anchovy stork, uh, uh, stuffed pork butt would have my interest because anchovies and meat marry very well together. I, you know, I don't know that we've ever had any real terrible disasters. I mean, don't forget, I'm wandering through the cook area this whole time and I'm going for group to group to group. So if I see somebody going astray, you know, I usually jump in. I, I actually can't think of a single really terrible disaster that we weren't able to turn into something delicious. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. So how about the opposite then? What are some of the most, uh, most stunning, most creative things that you've seen come through? Oh, boy. That is a, uh, that is a toughie. There have been so many. There have been some amazing 
grilled pizza. And when I say grilled pizza, I mean, I'm not talking about on a pizza stone or in a pizza oven. I'm talking about laying the dough right on the uh, grill grate, letting it puff and blister from underneath. So that was a very memorable dish. Um, we've had some really interesting desserts. Uh, somebody did, uh, you know, d combine brownies and marshmallows to make a, a brownie s'more, which was pretty fantastic. Uh, this last group, uh, they did a, a, grilled, uh, a grilled sangria where they grilled all the soup, fruit, fruit for the sangria. That was pretty amazing. They had a little help. They had a little help on that for me, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I was actually going to ask about some of those uh, smoked cocktails that you were mentioning before. Give us an idea of some of the uh, some of the different things that you come up with there. Well, Smoky Mary, for example, where you smoke the tomato uh, juice to make a uh, a uh, a Bloody Mary, where there's something called a mescalini, which I really like. I found that on a research trip to uh, Mexico. It's got a little bit like a margarita, but you use. Uh, a mezcal instead of tequila, so you get a smoky flavor that way. Uh, the thing goes into a pitcher. Uh, you muddle limes and mint, so there's a kind of a little bit of a mojito component. And then it goes in a pitcher covered with plastic, and you use a smoking gun to add an, ad an additional smoke flavor. Wow, that sounds delicious. I'd, I always thought uh, uh, mezcal and mescaline were um, hallucinogenic, but I might be confusing the two different things there. Yeah, so mescaline is hallucinogenic. Mezcal is the uh, smokier cousin of tequila. And it's made with cactus hearts, but what they do is they roast the cactus hearts in these giant fire-heated pits. They build, dig a big pit, line it with stones, build a giant wood bonfire in it, and then while it's still hot, they throw in the, the hearts of the cactus, roast those, and then those are pulped and fermented and distilled to make mezcal. And, uh, well, Ben, it's a little early for you, but I think I'm going to end my evening with a nice, uh, nice shot of mezcal tonight. That does sound good. I'm going to have to go down to the uh, bottle shop and try and hunt one up, I think. Now, Barbecue University has actually evolved into a TV show now, I was seeing on, the, uh, on your website there. Absolutely. So that was another thing on that little list I made uh, about things I, could, I wanted to do with barbecue. By the way, I make those lists, I put them in my wallet, carry them around, and uh, somehow by some magical spiritual force, it, uh, they, they, they happen. So it's a technique that I, uh, I recommend you try. It sounds goofy, and, but it works. Anyhow, I wanted to, you know, a Barbecue University, we're sort of limited to 50 or 60 people, and I wanted to reach a much larger audience. So I started, uh, I started a TV show, I created a TV show. And it's actually now in its fourth series. The first one was called Barbecue University, and that was more technique oriented. Then the second one was called uh, Plan uh, Primal Grill, and that was kind of more about my travels around the world's barbecue. Uh, the third show was Project Smoke, and we did three years of intense smoking and smoke cooking. And the new series now is called Project Fire, and it's more about grilling, but I, you know, I like to say it's grilling for the 21st century. So we're using a lot of cutting edge techniques, uh, uh, materials that we didn't have when I started in this business, salt slabs, cedar planks, cedar paper, blow torches, uh, pitchforks, uh, you know, you name it, I, uh, I use it. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. You get to pull all those different things together from all those different regions. And speaking of all those different regions, do you have a, a particular place where you saw something and it just went, oh, wow, and just sort of blew your mind? Or have you seen too much now and you don't get your mind blown anymore? Uh, you know what? I get my mind blown every day. Uh, every time I eat out, I get my mind blown. Uh, let me tell you a funny story. So the current book, is uh, called How to Grow Vegetables. The previous book was a book called The Brisket Chronicles. And it's all about brisket, not only barbecued brisket, but braised brisket, stewed brisket, their brisket side dishes, brisket breakfast dishes. There's even wow. a brisket dessert in the form of a smoked brisket chocolate chip cookie. But anyhow, I was on tour promoting the brisket book. And when I'm on tour, you know, I you typically go to 15 or 20 cities around North America. And I used that opportunity to do some eating out for my next, uh, my next cookbook. So while I was on tour for the Brisket Chronicles, I was eating primarily at vegan and vegetarian restaurants. I know, you know, make the cross. Uh, <laughs> There's some amazing, amazing 
vegan and vegetarian grilling and barbecue. And I think that was a real revelation. I remember I was in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia is famous for a dish called the cheesesteak, the Philly cheesesteak. It's basically a very cheap, thin cut of steak uh, cooked on a, uh, a griddle and topped uh, with the worst imaginable processed cheese you can imagine. And I found some guys that were doing a vegan cheesesteak with a mixture of mushrooms and seitan. And their cheese whiz was actually made out of uh, rutabaga, pureed rutabaga uh, with mustard and, and, and brewer's yeast. Absolutely fantastic. So those were the kind of discoveries uh, that I saw and love. Uh, and every time I travel, everywhere I go, you know, I'm always learning something new. I, I can't wait to get back to Australia because, by the way, I was there probably about 15 years ago. And I would say that you guys were just beginning your barbecue revolution. And I would bet now uh, when I come back, I will find dishes of sophistication, creativity, and imagination that, you know, are absolutely world class. So. Yeah, I've done a bit of travel through the United States, and I can certainly vouch for that. We've uh, we, we've caught up a long way in a very short time. It's uh, yes, it's a beautiful thing. Yep. Now, wh while we're talking about uh, t TV shows, I did see that you have appeared in French TV shows, and now that you've explained about your uh, French literature background and uh, studying in France, I can understand that. You've also got your own Italian show. Do you also speak Italian? Well, uh, I speak better Italian now than when I started it. I can let's say I can. <laughs> I, I get by in Italian. It's not super pretty, but uh, the premise of this show it was uh, I was approached by Gambaro Rosso, which is the Italian Food Network, because my books are translated into Italian. And a couple of my shows air on Italian television, so I I had no idea. But my I, 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 trip to Italy, people would stop me in the street and ask for selfies and. I had no idea what was going on, but apparently I had quite a following in Italy. So the premise of this show was I traveled around northern Italy. I met Italian grill masters, watched them at work, experienced their food. Then we rented a villa in Tuscany and set up a kind of a barbecue university type setup. And I created my own interpretations of the dishes that I had seen. So it was really fun. Uh, once I knew that I was going to be doing this, I started studying Italian like crazy. There's an app called Pimsleur, which is fantastic. I listen to it every morning. I still listen to Italian uh, radio every morning. And, uh, you know, learning new languages is one of the great pleasures of, uh, of barbecue. I, I do the shows in French, and I'm pretty fluent in French, so that was easy. Italian was more of a challenge. Uh, I speak some German, so uh, when... Planet Barbecue came out in German. I did a book tour in Germany. It all came back to me, and that was really fun. Uh, you know, what's so amazing, so amazing about my career in barbecue and just barbecue in general is you never know what, what tomorrow is going to bring. And for me, it's brought more surprises and astonishments than I would have ever dreamt possible. Yeah, some incredible uh, opportunities and, and achievements in there for sure. Now, in, in terms of the uh, the Italian style of, of cooking, when a lot of us think about Italian style, we either think of wood-fired pizza ovens or we think of huge pots of pasta cooked by Nonna. What sort of, uh, where are they at with sort of grilling and, and, and live fire cooking? Uh, totally obsessed with grilling and live fire cooking. I'm sure have been since at least Roman times. In fact, you know the bread called focaccia? Yes. It comes from yes. the Latin word focus, and the focus was the raised hearth on which people did grilling in ancient Roman times. But in Italy, gr grilling is a, um, it's much, it's a much more subtle art. First of all, Italians are obsessed with in the quality of the ingredients and they do as little to those ingredients as possible. So when I would do an elaborate rub to put on uh, a veal chop or a piece of meat, you know, they thought uh, heresy, uh, when I put clams and bacon and tomatoes on top of a grilled pizza, I thought the crew was going to walk off the set. You know, um, <laughs> it's a very simple. And from a food writer's point of view, Italian grilling can sometimes be very frustrating because it's every recipe is, you know, uh, hot fire, salt, olive oil, squeeze of lemon juice, maybe a whisper of rosemary or sage. Uh, repeat ad infinitum. 
Uh, they really don't go on in for elaborate rubs. Uh, you know, but then again, this is the country that created porchetta. This is the country that created bruschetta. This is the country that created bistecca alla Fiorentina. So if you were in Italy and you keep your eyes open, you can eat amazing uh, grilling, uh, amazingly well on, off the grill. Yeah. Now, I, I recognize the first two that you mentioned, the, the porchetta and the bruschetta. What was the third one? Bistecca alla Fiorentina. It's the, the Florentine steak. It's the, uh, the iconic dish of, uh, of Florence and Tuscany. And basically, it's a poor, what we would call in the States a porterhouse steak or T-bone steak, real thick, you know, I mean, easily 10 centimeters thick. And uh, it's grilled over a, either a wood fire or charcoal fire. What's interesting is they sear one side, sear the other, and then they stand it upright and they let the heat be conducted through the bone to cook it, uh, cook the middle. Now, cook is a relative term in Italy. I mean, their perfect method of cooking is lightly seared on the outside and still mooing in the center. But it is sliced <laughs> and it's drizzled with olive oil and you mix it with the meat juices as you're carving it. You sprinkle it with sea salt. And it's simply one of the most sublime experiences you can have on Planet Barbecue. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. All righty, Stephen. So we're in the third part of our show now, and this is the, the segment where our guest gets to teach our viewers and our listeners something, share some wisdom, give some, uh, some tips and techniques. So uh, I'm, I'm going to throw it over to you, and I'm going to just sit back and write some notes and ask you some questions in a couple of minutes. Absolutely. Well, since the most recent book uh, was How to Grow Vegetables, let's talk about how to grow vegetables. And uh, the first thing you need to know about grilling vegetables is, is that there is no one size that fits all or one method that fits all. High moisture vegetables like uh, peppers or mushrooms or tomatoes or zucchini require very different cooking method than hard, firm, uh, dense vegetables like artichokes or rutabagas or winter squash. Um, so... Uh, with high moisture vegetables, with small vegetables, you want to work over direct grilling, over a uh, direct grilling over a hot fire. Uh, with your denser, firmer vegetables, uh, the other night I did butternut squash. Uh, that's an indirect grilling situation. In fact, with butternut squash, what I like to do is cut it in half, scoop out the seeds, place it cut side down on a salt slab, and indirect it, grill it on the salt slab until almost done, then turn it over, finish it cut side up. Maybe it gets filled with a, farm, a Parmesan flan. Maybe it gets filled with wild rice and cranberries. Uh, maybe it gets brushed with maple syrup and filled with butter and brown sugar. Uh, it's incredibly versatile. Uh, one of my favorite techniques for grilling vegetables is what I call caveman grilling. And that is where you start with a charcoal grill, you get rid of the grill grate, and you do your grilling directly on the coals. Now, maybe some of you have seen me do that with steak. Uh, I've done it in the TV show. I've done it in many of my books. But caveman grilling is also excellent for vegetables. For example, you might take sweet potatoes, lay them in the skins on the embers, roast them until blackened on the outside, tender on the inside. The smoke flavor that you get from cavemaning is incomparable. Or you might take bell peppers and just lay bell peppers on the embers and by burning off the, the skins, you impart a smokiness and a supernatural sweetness you just can't get with any other cooking method. Uh, what else have I caved, man? Uh, oh, boy. Well, corn. Corn on the cob. So I'm usually a naked corn griller, meaning that I strip the husk off before I grill the corn. So you're actually charring and caramelizing the, the corn kernels. But the one exception to that is if you leave your corn in the husk, you can lay it directly on the embers. You burn the husk off the embers. And uh, when you see kind of a speckled golden and brown kernels, you know you're ready. That corn slathered with a little butter is delicious beyond belief. Uh, and then if you have any extra corn, which you usually don't in my house, but if you do, you cut it off the kernels. <laughs> makes amazing salads, great chowders. Uh, I've even put it in ice cream. That sounds incredible. I I would imagine that that would make a really tasty relish as well. And then something that my mother used to do when I was growing up is she'd 
leave some cream cheese to hit room temperature and then pour corn relish over that and then mix it all up in, into a dip. Um, uh, hooray for mom. You give her, give, give her a big kiss for me. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, sounds, sounds delicious. Now, one thing that, um, that uh, I've, I've always been curious about, I've never actually tried it myself, was grilled lettuce. Have you tried grilling lettuce? Oh, sure, all the time. In fact, uh, I mean, many ways to, appro- to proceed on that. If it is a firm lettuce, like what we call iceberg lettuce or radicchio or treviso, cut it in quarters, grill it over a super hot fire. You're ahead of the game if you're working on a wood fire or wood enhanced fire because some of that smoke goes up between the leaves. For the more delicate lettuces, uh, I've got what's called a smoked lettuce salad in the book. And I smoke, uh, you set your grill up for indirect grilling. Uh, To generate the smoke, I'm using hay instead of wood because it gives you a very quick burst of smoke quickly uh, without, you know, without generating a lot of heat. The lettuce goes uh, on a pan of ice so it stays cold. A couple of minutes, you just put a smoke flavor on, simple vinaigrette dressing. It's one of those things, you know, again, I was talking about sort of smoke being the umami of barbecue. Well, this is an instance where smoke, you know, Lettuce is something we eat five times a week, our whole lives. But when you taste the smoke, all of a sudden, like, wow, I never thought about lettuce that way. You're kind of rediscovering it for the first time. How does it not wilt in the heat? Or is it because it's just on so quickly, it's sort of on and off, and it, and well, then it doesn't three, wilt? Well, three ways. So remember, it's on a pan of ice, so that kind of keeps it cold locally. You're smoking with hay, which smolders and burns in less than a minute. So it's a very quick smoke. And then you've got your grill set up, so the lettuce is on one side and the, um, uh, the uh, fire source, the heat source is on the other side. But uh, you, gotta, okay. you have to work quickly. You have to work quickly. That's a technique, by the way, that I learned in Italy. Uh, they use that technique for smoking uh, mozzarella uh, and scamorza cheese. And, um, and, you know, again, they're using the straw and they've got the heat source very far away from the fire, uh, which is what keeps the cheese from melting. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Now, have you ever come across a vegetable that you should never grill? Um, I've come across some that would not seem like likely candidates. Uh, lettuce being one, for example. Uh, beets, beets were kind of challenging, you know, uh, because beets, first of all, they're firm. So you can, th- you can ember roast beets. That's pretty interesting. You try and smoke a beet and it's so strong flavor that it doesn't really absorb the smoke all that well, except to every rule or statement, there's an exception. And there is a smoked beet salad. It was actually created by uh, my friend and our grill wrangler, Steve Nestor. And a uh, grill wrangler, that is a very interesting job on my TV show. He's the guy, or she it could be, that builds, assembles all the grills when we start, keeps them fueled, makes sure they're clean, rolls them in and out of the set so when we move from one grill to the other. You know, because on the TV show, we're always cooking on different grills. Yeah, you definitely need someone to uh, to help get that on and off stage. I remember from my uh, undergrad work in drama, we we always had stagehands dressed in black in the background, moving things on and off. So, so uh, no wonder you're dressed in black, and you're no wonder you're so good at this podcast. You have a drama background. I can see it. Maybe. Well, the the black thing is just because it's slimming, and since I got into barbecue ah. and less, since I got into barbecue and less into martial arts, I need to uh, wear some more flattering clothing. <laughs> Um, so now, okay, now that's, uh, that's, uh, grilled vegetables and, uh, grilled vegetables is just sort of one part of a traditional Thanksgiving meal and Thanksgiving is just around the corner. So I'm just wondering, you, uh, you mentioned it before, if you could just give us just quickly your top three tips for cooking a, a whole turkey for Thanksgiving to, to go with those delicious grilled vegetables. Uh, absolutely. So by the way, do you guys have Thanksgiving too down there? Um, I do because my wife is American and I, there's okay. quite a, there's quite a large sort of expat community around us. So, Okay. Well, at any rate, so number one, uh, I always buy an organic bird or farm-raised bird. I mean, the quality of your bird, first of all, your bird can never be good than, your cooked turkey can never be better than the, uh, the you know, the bird you start with. Um, number two, I'm a big partisan of brining bird uh, uh, turkey, and I brine it. It's a salt, sugar, salt, honey mixture. 
uh, bourbon often finds its way into the brine. I like to brine it for 24 hours. You know, turkey has a tendency to dry out, so brining just adds a little extra moistness. Uh, number three, I uh, I cook it at a. I don't slow and st low and slow smoke it because I like crisp turkey skin. So. I tend to cook my turkey about uh, 350, 375 degrees. Sometimes I'll spit roast it, sometimes I'll indirect grill it, uh, but always at the higher temperature so you crisp the skin. And I like to work with small turkeys. I'd rather do two 12 pound turkeys, you know, than one 20 pound behemoth. Yeah, fair enough. All right, some, some great tips there to help get us started. Okay, well, this is the uh, probably good point for us to start wrapping up the show now. So I'm going to throw it over to you, and uh, you can give some thanks and praise to people that have helped you out along the way. And also, make sure you tell everybody where they can track you down and follow you on the on the internet and social media. Absolutely. Well, first, thanking people, you know, all the great grill masters all over the world who have uh, shared their secrets and their techniques with me. And uh, in Australia, you know, if you read my book, Planet Barbecue, uh, I, I thank... Uh, the people too numerous to mention now, but I was really shown great hospi uh, hospitality and had great food when I visited Australia. Uh, in terms of how to find me, my websites are <clears throat> are stephenreichland.com. Uh, that's for my uh, TV show. And barbecuebible.com. Uh, that's B-A-R-B-E-C-U-E, B-I-B-L-E.com. Uh, and... Uh, that's sort of all things barbecue. Stephen Reichland, sign up for my Up and Smoke newsletter, uh, which comes out uh, once a week, full of tips, recipes, my travels, restaurant recommendations, really pretty much all things barbecue uh, involved. Uh, on social media, I am Stephen Reichland on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and very recently uh, on uh, TikTok. And uh, if you, you know, uh, I will guarantee you a new and different post, at least one every day on those platforms. Uh, it's uh, really have fun with that. And I love, love hearing from uh, grill, grill masters and grilling enthusiasts all over the world. So please, if you're listening to this, you know, give me a, uh, give me a shout out. You'll get an answer. Sounds great, man. I, lo I, I love the sound of all of that stuff. Now, I just want to say personally, huge thank you for coming on board the show. I've been a huge fan of what you've been doing for such a long time. You're such an inspiration to people such as myself, try, trying to do what, what we want to do here in the barbecue world as well. And I'm sure that all the listeners and viewers have had a great time uh, listening to your stories and, uh, and uh, soaking up all those tips and, and tricks as well. So thank you very much for taking the time out today to come on the show. Thank you and grill on. Yeah. I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. And there you have it, family. That was the one and only Stephen Reichland. How lucky are we to have had such an amazing uh, personality in the barbecue scene? I mean, he's, he's visited 70 countries, 31 books. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. I, I doubt that I could even hope to forget as, uh, I, I totally messed that, got that back to front. I can only hope that I could ever know as much as he's forgotten. There we go. That's what it is. I finally got it out. It took me a little while. I got it. Um, it just what an opportunity. So huge, huge thank you once again. And uh, I'm going to be getting my turkey nice and ready for Thanksgiving in a couple of weeks for my lovely wife. Now, before we do round this out today, I'm just going to uh, remind you of the announcements from the top of the show. So big thank you to our podcast partner, Jagged, for coming on board today and helping us bring you this amazing episode of the show. If you are out there looking for a new smoker or grill, hunt them down. They are great people and they do fantastic work. I've got one literally right out behind this window here and it is just divine. Um, head on over to the website, pick up the ebook, The Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. That is a really good read, awarded by the MBBQA and completely free. So head on over there, check that out, get yourself a copy of that. Join us in the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community. That, that's where we recorded this today. So people have been able to get a sneak peek. Um, because it's a couple of weeks between when we record and when we publish. So not only do you get a, a sneak peek, but you do get to, uh, you know, put your comments in and, uh, and ask any questions that I can then put to the guest as well. And we just get to hang out and talk about barbecue in a family-friendly space, which, let's face it, that's getting rarer and rarer on the internet. Um, and then if you are catching this later on, do the thing for us on the socials. You know the thing, the thumbs up, the likes, the shares, the comments, the all that stuff. That really helps us out. And we would really appreciate it if you could do that for us. 
But that is all the time that we have for today. So until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>